I would actually like to thank the few people that actually made this, that made it to this talk. Um, and my purpose in life here in this talk is actually like, um, since we have a company called Recurity Labs that actually did this research, I get to have brilliant young people working for me that actually like do cool stuff and do stuff that we need. And I get to like wrestle myself into the talk so I can claim the fame and then um, they present the technical details and then I'm running around, see I'm a speaker. So um, this is actually what I do right now here. So we're talking about a port scanner and as I see, most people do not consider this a cool topic. Um, first of all, if you have been writing a port scanner before, like if you write port scanners, no matter if it's a worldwide used one or a very little used one, um, this is not religion. Port scanning is actually, as the name suggests, scanning ports is sports. So we actually do have competition and yes, it actually makes more fun if more than one is playing. Um, so if you have been writing a port scanner, don't be upset that we did that too. Um, but like, enter the competition. Now the question is why would we actually develop a port scanner? This is a um, research project of um, a company, so we actually have a reason that we do this. Otherwise we would do another research project. Um, because for us, port scanning is actually not fun. Um, for most people it is, you turn on random scanning, you find random boxes, you own them. Um, for us it's not, it's actually work. Um, we actually need accuracy, we need speed, because our customers actually are paying us for the time we spend on a task. And if we're spending a long time on the task of port scanning a network, they're spending more money. And if they're asking us how much money is it gonna cost to scan this network, we actually need a predictable port scanner to tell them. So we actually needed a port scanner that actually runs on dedicated machines and provides all that to us. Now, obvious question, why not Nmap? Um, we had some experiences um, with Nmap that were less than pleasant, and I'm actually coming of age, so um, you can only jerk off that many times a day on internet porn while waiting for your uh, port scanner to finish. And that does not, that number does not increase over time. So um, I actually needed a faster port scanner for that. Um, professionals, in fact, don't really scan machines that are powered off, disassembled, and like currently being carried around in the office. Um, so we do have a very limited set of requirements for our port scanner. Um, and large network scanning is actually um, stock taking for the company we do this for, um, rather than vulnerability identification because that comes afterwards. On a higher level, um, the thing is this, all the discovery methods, all the fingerprinting, all the banner grabbing, everything else that we know and that we use depend on a single data item and that is a list of open TCP ports. Um, so we actually wanted to concentrate on obtaining this single data item before doing anything other fancy and you know, like fingerprint and whatnot in vulnerability scan. Um, accordingly, this also takes the most part of the time. Like once you know what ports are really open, which are filtered and which are closed, um, you can actually do all that fancy shit. Um, but the most time actually goes into the scanning. And while we're actually at it, developing it new, how about having actual algorithms, like stuff you can write down on paper and calculate, instead of a whole bunch of if statements nested into each other in the hopes that it like actually will produce a fast and accurate result. So this is our requirements. We wanted a TCP SYN scanner, nothing fancy, no Christmas trees. Um, they're just taking too much space in the office anyway. Um, we wanted no UDP scanning because frankly, in today's world, UDP scanning is actually of no value whatsoever. Um, especially or because when you're scanning firewalled machines and every machine nowadays should actually have a local firewall. Because UDP scanning is a negative scan method. You send a packet and you get a packet ICMP back saying this port is closed. 
which means if it's firewalled, you don't get a packet back, and if it's open, you don't get a packet back. So what's the point? Um, we wanted constant access to the data we get, like once something actually happens, I want to know that right now, because then I can actually offload um, other work to other machines and not wait till the whole thing finishes and or crashes. Um, it is designed for embedded use, so what we're doing is we write a port scanner that runs on a dedicated embedded machine, which has this wonderful effect of we can have this small so egress box or something, and we can just like ship it to the customer and tell them, you know what, connect this to the network, and when it stops blinking, send it back. Which makes the whole exercise really, really cheap because there is no human intervention involved. And that's about it. We wanted to do it like one thing and do this right. And this is the point in time where I actually like handed over to the researcher Fabs who actually did the work so he can actually tell you how we all did that. Hello. Um, since you've probably never seen me before, um, thank you. Okay. Um, I thought I'd just uh, tell you a few things about me before we start talking about the scanner for the rest of the slides. Um, my name's up there. Um, I'm 22 years old. I live in Berlin and I work for Security Labs. And I study computer science and electrical engineering. And I'm really into networking and reading and writing code. So that's my random nerd profile, so to say. Okay, um, now about Port Bunny. Um, the goal is very clear, and it, I guess pretty much every port scanner has this goal. Um, you want accurate results, and you want them as fast as possible. Um, now, the difficulties associated with this is uh, that all performance questions in data networks tend to be uh, a really complex topic. It's not really simple. And secondly, uh, there are just there are, there's a huge amount of uh, different setups that you will find, and you kind of want to deal with all of them, but uh, you have to make sure that you don't end up, you know, just uh, waiting for email uh, from people telling you that in in this one network it didn't work. Why don't you insert like a delay here or do something there? Because then you'll end up with this this giant, you know. Uh, patched together lots of if statements and, and no real, you know, algorithm. So what, what our approach is actually, uh, you know, let's, let's develop algorithms for this which uh, um, have a strong theoretical foundation. Okay, but we've, before we go into that, let's just, you know, quickly review the basics. Uh, you probably all know this, but still, um, I don't want to lose anybody on the first couple of slides. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really simple, actually. You wouldn't really expect it to be that big of a problem. Um, all you do is, uh, since you want to know if you can connect to a port, uh, of course, you will just connect to, the, to each port in a row um, by sending a connection request in the form of a TCP SYN packet, and you will just observe the answers. So if you get an RST ACK, then the port is closed. If you get a SYN ACK, the port is open. And if you get no response at all, then uh, the port is filtered. So that sounds really simple. So why can't you just write a port scanner like this? Why can't you just wrap a loop around the send call and then just you know, wait for responses um, and just you know, output the results? Well, the problem is if you're going to do this, then the network um, is just going to drop lots and lots of packets because you're just sending as fast as you possibly can, but uh, the network can't really handle that. So there is some kind of optimal speed that you need to, uh, you need to calculate, and it's not quite clear how, how you're going to get there. So you're probably saying, wait a minute, um, if, if, I, if I do, do my regular socket programming and I just connect somewhere and then uh, I just send until uh, there's no data left, you know, that works. Yeah, that does work, but that only works because TCP is actually doing the work for you. Um, it's implementing the congestion control. But when we're port scanning, w we never really have an established TCP connection um, because we're only uh, um, ever sending the, uh, the connection requests. So this is all on still on top of IP. So the first approach to finding this optimal speed would probably be, the, be to ask the question, um, can we just ask the network you know, how fast we can go? 
And the general um, um, answer to this is no, although there are exceptions. Uh, for example, ICMP source quenches and ECN. Um, so, so people kind of want to have this, but if you write a port scanner, you can't expect the network to actually have it. So the only info that we actually do have is if a response is received, uh, then we have a round trip time. And then the other thing is if, if we do know that some packet should produce an answer and it doesn't, then we can detect packet drops. And that's really just all uh, that we have for our timing code. Okay, so, so, so let's take a look at you know, the, the environment that we're working in, uh, the network. Um, so we have a bunch of nodes and they're all connected through links which have different qualities, different uh, throughput delay and reliability. Um, and each of these nodes, and that's, uh, that's an important fact, um, has a queuing capacity. Uh, packets is, are s stored in the nodes and then forwarded. So if, if we simplify this and think about the term bottleneck and experience from socket programming, then we might come to a model like this, uh, kind of pipe model where uh, you have uh, one part of the pipe that's just not as thick as the rest, uh, which is like the bottleneck. So if you were to find, uh, you, if you were to try to find the optimal speed, um, then this is probably what it would look like. Um, you're just uh, trying to find the, the optimal spacing between two packets that you send. So this is slow, faster, and then at optimal speed, there's just no spacing left. But with that model, you are ignoring the queuing capacity. Because if you think about it, um, just because you can fire 10 packets at a delay of exactly zero and they will produce answers, that doesn't mean that you can do the same thing with 100 packets. Um, because of the queuing capacity. So uh, that, uh, that fact uh, leads to a new kind of more professional model that we used, which is uh, the bucket model. So uh, you can think of uh, each uh, host as a bucket with a, hole, uh, uh, with a hole in it. And basically what you want to do is you want to have all the buckets filled at all times. So you're not asking yourself, how long are the delays between my packet sends, but rather, how much data can be out in the network at once? And the beauty of all of this is that it's, it's self-clocked, meaning that uh, um, you don't have to ask yourself a question when you will actually send data, because you send data when uh, other data leaves the network. And funnily, funnily enough, uh, this question of how much data can be at the network at once is uh, the exact question that TCP congestion control algorithms ask. And that is a very active research field. So it really makes sense to you know, kind of uh, make your port scan compatible to uh, what you find uh, for in TCP congestion control so that you can actually make use of those uh, research results. But that's not directly possible because uh, the situation is just uh, very different. Um, in TCP, uh, the receiver actually acknowledges the packets, while when you port scan, as you saw earlier, if, uh, if you send a probe, then it might just happen that you get no response at all because uh, the port is just filtered. And for that reason, timeouts in, in TCP are an error condition while when port scanning, it, it could be the correct behavior. Um, furthermore, uh, in TCP, you have sequence numbers, and if you don't, uh, you know, if you kind of integrate them into your port scanning probes, you usually don't have sequence numbers with your port scanning probes. So in other words, uh, the TCP receiver is cooperative. Um, a port scanned host is not. Um, of course, that does not mean we can't force it to be. <laughs> So what we do before we start the scan is uh, we try to get a response from the host um, by sending uh, those, uh, those packets that you see there. So we, we try to send uh, SYN packets on different ports. Uh, we try ACK probes, uh, echo requests, and so on. And uh, once we get a response, then we actually have a packet where we do know that it should produce a response. 
And what we do then is uh, that we don't, uh, that, we, that we send our um, probes in so-called batches, which we terminate with a trigger. So now we know that uh, while we don't know if the probes will actually produce answers, we do know that the entire batch uh, must produce an answer. And if it doesn't, then uh, it's an error condition. Okay, so then uh, if the trigger returns, um, the probability is actually high that all of these other packets um, actually made it through two. Um, the reason for this is that you know there are, there are basically two types of um, reasons for packet drops. The first one is uh, queues overflow, in which case entire batches are discarded. And the second is physical transmission errors, especially in wireless uh, scenarios. And also in this case, entire batches of data are just uh, um, discarded. So uh, there's one exception, which is random early drop. I'll not, not go into that, but uh, yeah, uh, it's a notable exception. So if the probes do drop, um, what we do is that we say, no, if, if the trigger does drop, what we do is uh, we say that all of the probes which were in the batch need to be resent. And uh, yeah, okay. Um, so what's this whole trigger thing good for? Well, the trigger responses now play the same role as the acknowledgements do in TCP congestion control. Uh, so we kind, of, we kind of made it compatible to the scenario that TCP, uh, that you find yourself in when you do TCP congestion control. And a timeout is actually a signal of error. So if you compare this with what, what Nmap does, Nmap does uh, so-called probe-based, well, I call it probe-based congestion control, uh, which means um, they don't have these triggers, they just send the probes and just hope that they produce answers. And if they do, then it all works out just fine. Uh, this is the, this, what you see in the graph is the number of packets which are out at once. But um, if there are no responses, if the host is filtered mostly, then it all just breaks down. There is a slight exception to this, which is the port scan ping system, which basically means that if the host does not respond for five seconds, then a ping is sent, um, and then a response is counted as free regular uh, responses uh, that you would have no normally gotten. Okay, so, so this is actually the research result, the first real research result uh, what we get when we use the trigger is that uh, it does not matter whether the host is mostly filtered or not. We get pretty much the same scanning times. So uh, this is just, of course, this is these are just example numbers, but um, you know the the, the difference in in the magnitude. Um, yeah, that. So we have 12 minutes and 18 seconds for Nmap on this host and then 15 seconds for port bunny. This is, yeah, this is actually the time in the talk where the audience needs to go, oh. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at this again. Uh, now that we have trigger-based scanning, uh, triggers are acknowledged, so that's just like the TCP packets. Uh, timeouts are error conditions, and uh, we use sequence numbers uh, in all triggers. So it's, it's totally compatible. So now uh, what we can do is we can implement any congestion control scheme um, that we want. And uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what it means. <laughs> and it's actually, you know, it, it's clean. If, if you take a look at this, um, since you just, just can't expect that uh, a probe will actually produce an answer. You cannot do congestion control with probes. Okay. Of course there are problems with this approach. Um, notably, not all triggers uh, have the same quality. Um, for example, uh, ICMP may be rate limited and your trigger is an ICMP trigger, but your actual probes are not uh, rate limited. And there's QoS, so that might po pose a problem. Um, and we, well, we have a bit of a fix for this, but uh, it remains a problem. 
um, we try to find uh, the good triggers first and only you know use the others as a fallback solution and if while scanning we find something that we can use as the trigger which is better than the triggers we currently have then we just discard the worst ones so is the problem completely solved um, not quite because the bucket model um, is actually not valid for rate limiting firewall configurations while well, it's totally fine uh, for uh, you know normal congestion situations and secondly um, we can uh, we can implement any congestion control scheme but how will the user know which one to choose I mean uh, in advance so the scanner needs to perform some kind of detection detection such as is there a rate limiting firewall are we in a wireless scenario? What, what timing algorithm do, do we want to use? And the scanner is actually the expert on this issue because it is directly talking to the host uh, that it's, that's being scanned um, and not the user. So what I'm gonna present now is how we did uh, rate limiting firewall detection. And let's uh, first take a look at how uh, Nmap does this. Um, there's this comment here um, you can find in the Nmap source code. Basically what they do is um, if there's, hi, <laughs> if, uh, if packet drops just, if just everything goes totally wrong, if packets just drop and drop and drop, then they say that's, uh, that's a firewall most probably. And then they actually make this decision. Uh, we're going to revert to uh, timing delays instead of doing our normal congestion control. Uh, so that's a major decision, and that breaks the entire timing concept, because they, you know, they start using the congestion control algorithms. But now, uh, the the uh, the congestion window is actually not the number of probes, uh, the, the the data out in the network at once anymore, because they have r just random delays between the probes. And the whole, you know, the whole self-clocking thing, which was so beautiful about the, about the congestion control. It's just lost in this approach. So, and this is the effect of a false positive. Um, here in this scenario, Nmap did, uh, thought it detected a rate limited firewall. So the scan then took uh, 24 seconds, uh, 24 minutes, while um, Port Bunny just did the normal congestion control, which was correct in the scenario, and then that took eight minutes. So there's. Okay, so what's our approach to this? Well, uh, we don't just want to take uh, the, uh, um, the packet drops into account, but also the RTT. Because if you look into your networking textbooks, you will find this and it tells you that if you get congestion, then uh, the delay will, will rise exponentially. So can we just detect this somehow? I mean with a firewall configuration, there's just no reason why the RTT should raise exponentially, okay? So uh, why not try to look at the RTT after a drop and maybe see if you know, it makes a difference for a rate limiter and a congestion situation? Um, and given the fact that we're constantly changing the speed, we're try trying to adapt to the network conditions, um, this graph can be rather ugly, but it turns out that in reality, it looks like this. So that's, that's really cool because, you know, the, the thing in the, on, in the top, you probably can't read that. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's the uh, RTT development with a rate uh, limited firewall. And the thing down there is uh, for a normal congestion situation. And what you see is that for the normal congestion situation, um, you actually see the RTT rise just before the drop. And then of course we, we regulate, we, we send less data, and then uh, the RTT shrinks again. Well, for a rate limited firewall system, that's pretty much of a ticket system. It's, it's generating um, tickets that you can take like every, uh, at, at, a, at a fixed time interval. So what you see is that our, our timing decides that we can only send about one packet uh, at once. 
Um, and so we produce a very low uh, network load, which results in the fact that we're, we're very, very close to the base RTT, the, the, the round trip time um, that you get when there's just no load in the network. So this, these kinds of graphs, you, can, you could easily, well, it's not easy, but um, you can use uh, all your signal processing skills and just you know, make the decision. So and we're working on this approach, but uh, we're not quite done with it, but we found another nice approach, which I want to show you, and it's kind of a two-shot approach. Observe. <laughs> this is a packet, but uh, this is a packet too. So now, if, if the bucket says that I can fit four of those Kit Kats, or I can fit four of the rice bags, then, you know, it's obviously not really a bucket. Okay, the, the, the thing is that uh, uh, a rate limiter limit, limits the number of packets while congestion is caused by too much data. So if you enlarge the packet and it still tells you, uh, I can still fit these larger packets as well, then, uh, you know, that's not, that's really not a normal congestion situation. Okay, so in reality, of course, if you just enlarge by the TCP SYN packet by 40 byte, which is what you can do with uh, TCP options, um, that won't change much. Um, if you take ICMP, then uh, echo requests, then that works just fine. Um, but what you can do is you can just create background traffic. Uh, you don't actually have to have packets which will reach the host. You just have to have packets which will reach large uh, amounts of the network path because congestion is something that, you know, spreads, okay? So let's take a look at this in, uh, in reality. So this is, uh, we, ha we ha made a little web interface to switch our firewall on and off, and uh, we uh, um, s first switched it off, and then we uh, run the test, okay? So first of the little packets, we got 49 responses, and for the big packets, we got 28. So that looks very much like congestion. Okay, wait, let's look at this first. Um, and then for the rate limiting firewall, is, um, in both cases, we got 20 responses. And you can actually see in the configuration that that was what, what was put down for the, the rate limitation, uh, for the burst size limitation. So we can not only detect the rate limiting firewall, but also, uh, you know, get parts of the configuration. And this is what it looked like in reality. Uh, in, in the back, you see the, the small packet, uh, the small packets, and in the front, uh, you have this mixture of this, uh, the small packets and background traffic, which were UDP datagrams. Okay, uh, using PortBunny, well, uh, you can download uh, the newest version at portbunnyrecurity.com. Um, it's really simple to use. You just give it a host name or a network, and uh, you, c you can use the D flag, then it only does the discovery. Uh, but, you know, we don't have a huge amount of options because that is exactly what we don't want to have. Uh, what you can also do is use the slash L flag, um, which will generate a detailed scan log, which looks something like this. And if you send this to us, or if you just, uh, you know, load this into your favorite uh, spreadsheet program, um, then we can, you know, g generate uh, the data from it that we need to uh, identify whether what we did was correct or not and where the bugs are. Okay, thank you. So that's what you get when you have, like, um, small half Japanese researcher, they're just way too ninja fast. So we got plenty of time for questions if anyone has any. There is one. We um, do you mean run it on slow Laris or against slow Laris? <laughs> no, this is a Linux kernel module. So this runs entirely in a Linux kernel, which surprisingly I think you actually didn't mention. No, not really. If, if you want to talk about kernel stuff, then, you know, you can buy me a beer and th we will talk about so that. But the reason we're running this in a Linux kernel is simply because nothing is interfering with our traffic. 
and we also have very precise timing that you never get in a user land because you get like fucking out switch. That's like, that's the reason. No, we're not running this on anything except for Linux. We've run it against slow Laris quite well, yes. Oh, I think there is, Fabs, you know more about this. There are ports going on, like people yeah. actually ask us, we never planned of having that on other operating systems because we only, only wanted that, as I said in the beginning, for the embedded use. Um, but there are actually people porting this stuff to BSD, as far as I know. Like, yeah, we have actually set up a SVN exactly for that reason, um, that someone wanted to port it to BSD. I don't know how far he got already. He just started. Yeah, he just started, uh, not very far yet. So it, yeah, yeah, if you wanna jump in, there is a public subversion um, that you can play with and like read the code and then you get access to it and then you can just submit. So the question is of uh, the question is synchronous or asynchronous. I think what you're actually asking is if it's stateful or not. Yes, it is stateful. It has to be. Otherwise, it doesn't produce yeah, it is, yeah. decent responses. So uh, you've seen several ways in which the network can delay your packets, congestion, uh, bucket, a firewall. Have you seen other ways? I mean, there are devices that try to do both, like the Packeteer or StealthWatch or any one of those smarter network devices. Maybe they can, uh, maybe they reveal, you know, a mix of behaviors like that. Maybe there are both a bucket and uh, a pipe. Yeah, uh, that's uh, quite possible. Right now, you know, we're, we're going one step at a time. The, the first uh, really important case was uh, the normal congestion. Then the second is obviously the rate limiters. Uh, but then uh, we're hopefully going to go into these kinds of things. Because of course. So are you looking to identify what might be on the path? Because, say, at some point uh, on our campus, we saw something really strange after a certain uh, Cisco firmware update, every 10th TCP packet would be delayed uh, more than others. Uh, well, so, but you know, we, we, we would have loved to know exactly what changed by those response characteristics. So I'm thinking once you're already doing that, some sort of frequency analysis on that signal, you know, but that I'm clearly overstepping my time. No, it's, it's actually a very valid question, and this is exactly the reason why Fabs had that, that slide about send us your scan logs. Like in some scenarios, you actually do not scan um, hosts that you want to own, but you're actually like scanning it in your own network, for example. And if you experience strange behavior of port bunny, the only way we can actually fix the algorithms is getting the logs. And that is, well, we cannot like have the office full of networking equipment and then like try to build complex networks. So this is why we are actually asking for the locks. We don't want to know what ports are open on your machines because you are owned anyway. More questions? There is one. No, 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 no. There is no product attached to it. We're, we're just using those so egress boxes. Have you ever seen them, like small? And they're called Zoagris. There is another one called, um, do you know um, the, the Swiss, the little Swiss boxes? So you take a regular like PC platform for like home router, um, self-built home routers. Have you ever seen those? There are different types. And you take a regular one like this and you just put it into the startup scripts and say once you're booted, 
scan this IP address range, and then um, you usually have a command line tool in those in those um, Linux distributions for the small boxes where you can turn on the lights in front of them. That's what we do. Like there's, we don't have a like fixed product setting or something. Uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much what we use. So it's a GOD m mostly. Yeah. So thank you very much for. No, there is more questions. Hey. No, no, the, the thing is this. So you can actually have any performance you want with Nmap, and that is um, exactly the point of having um, all those command line switches. For me, the design requirement was to have a scanner that actually figures that out himself on a predictable basis. So in any given, like in many scenarios, you can tune your scanners any way you want and they will, in most cases, be faster, but that is not the point. If you're scanning something that you know how it's gonna react, why are you scanning it? So performance, this is why I said right in the beginning um, that this is actually sports. So um, the performance is not comparable. It is comparing apples um, to oranges in many cases. Do that make sense? No? Okay, I think on a, yeah, this, this is pretty much the graph that you're asking for. So on a filtered host, we outperform massively, and on a non-filtered host, it really depends. Yeah. Um, the thing is that uh, you can't really, uh, you know, the, the configuration that you have with Port Bunny is basically um, do whatever you think uh, is best for the network you're working in. And Nmap has that too, when you just start it without any flags like you know uh, maximum retries and uh, minimum delay and all these kinds of things. So the most comparable thing that you can do is you, you can maybe start it with, I don't know, uh, T4, T5 or something, and yeah, that, that's what you get then. And as a home exercise, scan an iPhone over wireless and wait. That is actually something he's... <laughs> for the rate limit detection? No, no. no. Um, for port detection. Um, I don't think we have any false positive because that just wouldn't make sense. Like, I cannot imagine to have one. It just doesn't make sense. However, um, false negative, I think we actually do have them in some case. I know that we had them, um, like, back in December or something. I don't know what the what the current experience is. Fabs is testing it all. Yeah, well, we don't have measurements on that. That's pretty much what you're asking, right? You know, about a number. No, we don't have a number right now, no. The thing is, if you ever find a false positive or false negative, be very, very sure to send us an email because that is a very major issue. And we care about that. I found false ne negatives in a very old version like way back then, so I can't tell over the current version because as I said in the beginning, I'm just the guy saying, you, do this. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. <laughs>